I'm Colleen Maiko. And I'm Peg Tillery. We're with Sam Maupin, nursery manager at the Brothers Greenhouses in Port Orchard, Washington. Welcome. Thanks for being here. We're honored to shoot episode four of Planted at a long-standing independent nursery. The three of us are going to talk about easy house plants growing with greenhouses. We'll build some fairy gardens and Sam will share his motivation for gardening. Off we go. The Brothers Greenhouses is a great place to find houseplants. Stop by frequently. My favorite houseplant is Maranta, commonly known as prayer plant. Thank you so much, Elise Watness Maupin, for the beautiful watercolor illustration of Maranta. Don't be afraid of growing houseplants. There are only a few things your houseplant needs to grow happily. Choose a container with good drainage. Soil will depend on your choice of plant. You'll find lots of potting soils for African violets and for succulents and all kinds of house plants. A good nursery person will help you choose the right planting medium for your house plant. Watering will depend on the type of plant. Some require more frequent watering than others. One key to success is the correct light exposure. Not too close to a window though, where it can be too hot or too cold, and a few plants really like lower light. Plants need food, just like us, but for them it's fertilizer. Do this in spring and summer months. There are many all-purpose fertilizers to use. Some are liquids, some are powdered. Here are just a few easy to grow house plants, but always remember, if you fail, they'll make great compost. Most people have great success growing prayer plants. They're from a huge family called Marantaceae. Their leaves fold up at night, and it's because there's a part on the stem called a pulvinus. Think of our muscles. It folds up the leaves in the evening and opens them again in the daytime. You will find lots of plants like this in this family. Succulents have thick leaves to help the plant survive on low watering conditions. They don't need to be watered very often, maybe only once a week. However, the plants that you see called holiday cactus, they are treated more like an African violet, but see their leaves are fleshy also. And here's another example of succulents. Third on this list of easy to grow house plants is cyclamen. They actually are um, kind of a plant that you'll find in the springtime and during the holidays. They, um, they're considered an annual as far as house plants go. They have a corm that they grow from. Think of a tennis ball cut in half and you'll find all kinds of colors of leaves and flowers. But there is also a cyclamen that grows out in the garden. So don't be confused. You might see all of these types. This one is outside in the garden. And it has little curly Q stems that you'll find. Now, you can plant these outside and sometimes they'll come back and sometimes they won't. These are just three of the great types of houseplants you can find for choices. You might have a good friend who grows houseplants. Pick their brain for tips. Remember, a houseplant was once a plant growing happily out in the wild. We humans have domesticated them, so to speak. And just like us and some of our outdoor plants, they have a certain lifespan. They won't live forever. Some websites make growing a houseplant seem very meticulously difficult. Don't worry. Try your luck with an easy to grow house plant, and if you fail, they really do make great compost. My favorite book on growing house plants is House Plant Expert by Dr. D.G. Hessian. And ourhouseplants.com is a great website for good information on how to grow house plants. can be full of magic and creativity, and nowhere is the magic more alive than at the Brothers Greenhouses, known for their fabulous Hobbit House. And you might even hear birdsong from the aviary behind us. 
Looking for materials and ideas to fuel your passion for creating fantastical gardens? Or maybe you're not familiar with the delightful art of fairy gardening. Well, be prepared to get hooked as I share some of the great ones created by the Brothers Greenhouse staff, and we'll make one together. Fairy gardens are fantasy worlds created to surprise and delight those who come upon them. And while miniature gardens have been popular since Victorian times, fairy gardens became an American thing following the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. The miniatures displayed there in bonsai dish gardens ignited imaginations, created magical places for elves, sprites, pixies, gnomes, and other enchanted folk is more popular than ever. Both children and adults enjoy making tiny gardens. Simple or elaborate, they allow for countless hours of imagination and make-believe. In a traditional pot, silly container, or the outdoor landscape, the possibilities for expression are endless. Fairy gardens include small plants scaled to look realistic with the tiny figurines placed among them. Slow-growing succulents and very low-growing ground covers like thyme are great choices. Then irresistible worlds are created among the plants to entice fairies to frolic. It's not unusual to find only the trappings of the fairy and not the fairies themselves. After all, they're a bit shy and are only seen by those who believe in them. To build our basic fairy garden, we're using a shallow container, multi-purpose potting soil, some carefully selected plants, moss, rocks, and a few adorable furnishings. And that's it. The materials are easy to find anywhere. After adding the soil, now it's the creative part, the layout of the plants and the figurines. I'm setting the plants around the edges to allow for an open space for my fairy house, which I'm going to place on a bed of moss that I brought from home. If you're having a hard time choosing what to include, think about how your garden spirits will play, relax, and enjoy their space. Most of our local independent nurseries carry a selection of cute fairy garden pieces, but many aficionados make their own from natural materials like twigs, stones, and seed pods, which bring as much joy to the creators as the finished gardens. Create some of your own garden magic with a whimsical miniature garden. When I started making these, my imagination led me to create a fairy garden. Where will your imagination take you? Peg's favorite book on the topic is Fairy Gardening by Julie Bodden Davis and Beverly Turner. Sam, you've been gardening for over 20 years at least. How did you start gardening? Yeah, well, I've been gardening professionally for over 20 years, but I was born during strawberry season. So that's probably when I was most in tune with the plants. But uh, honestly, I really recognized a connection with the plants as I was kind of coping with the loss of my father as a young adolescent. What are your memories about gardening as a child? Well, I worked with my family in cut flower production and we sold at the local farmer's market. And so that gave me something really beautiful and positive to focus on in that time. All my memories of cut flowers are very strong. I remember being shorter than the plants and running down rows. And uh, I remember the smell of the sunflowers and the stalk. And I remember the stinky smell of the rotting cut flowers as well. So there's all kinds of memories associated with that that uh, I relive all the time through my work here. Do you have some really favorite things about being a gardener? Of course, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Gardening feeds me both in, in many ways, emotionally, spiritually, and functionally, materially. And so uh, it's a really encouraging to get to focus your consciousness on the plants around you because they're really just symbols of the environment and there's nothing negative to be found in it when you look at it objectively. And so when you see the world through a gardener's eye, it's always a beautiful place. Definitely. Absolutely. Do you have any favorite plants? 
<laughs> that's yeah. a hard question to ask yeah. a gardener. Usually my favorite plant is the one that's ripe and ready to eat. <laughs> and so I really do focus on a lot of edible plants in my own landscape. Um, things that make fruits and vegetables and seeds and nuts and things, I like pretty much all of it. And so things that uh, do really well for me are the things that I can save seed from or things mm -hmm. that volunteer on their own. Uh, so in my garden, a really fun one is purple auric. I grow that as a tender green. Uh, red Russian kale feeds my family all year long. Mm -hmm. And columnar apples are like the easiest things to grow in the orchard. You don't have to prune them and they make some of the best fruit. So those are some standouts for me right now. Awesome. Awesome. Is there um, anything else that you'd like to say about gardening? Yeah, of course. I have so much to say, but <laughs> the most important thing to acknowledge is that gardening is the most fundamental basic thing humans do and everyone gardens whether you think you do or not if you eat food you garden if someone else is growing your food you're gardening by proxy if you're maintaining a landscape you're gardening it is the most essential thing you can do to contribute to the environment and to feel like you have a sense of place and so no matter where you are in the world gardening will bring you home Thank you, Sam, for inviting us into this wonderful nursery, the Brothers Greenhouses, and um, for sharing just a little bit about your life as a gardener. Thank you so much. Thank you. Considering taking your gardening to a new level with a backyard greenhouse? I'm here with Sam Maupin, who has 20 years experience working in greenhouses, and we're gonna discuss greenhouses, how they're used, and their benefits. Sam, we're here in one of how many greenhouses here at the Brothers? Well, with greenhouses, it's really more about square footage and volume than it is about number. Um, so we have about 30,000 square feet of covered growing area here. Most of that space is used for growing plants, but we also have some of it devoted to hard goods that we sell and workspaces that we use. Well, I'm curious about, for instance, this greenhouse and the others here. What are they made of and how old are they? Most of our space is covered by rigid polycarbonate plastic, and that's kind of expensive material. but. It lasts a lot longer than the cheap sheet plastic that's also common for covering greenhouses. Probably the best thing to use as a greenhouse glazing though is glass. So glass has the best insulation value and it has the best light quality. The only trouble with glass is that it's heavy and broken panes are kind of a serious issue. Our greenhouses are mostly 30 by 90 arch structures or Quonset structures that are gutter connected. And so it feels like one big space, although there are several connected greenhouses. Our two original greenhouses are peak arch structures and they're kind of the original Brothers Mountains um, that were built in 1969. That's great. Wow, so more than 50 years. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, if you maintain them, you, they can last a long time. Well, I've noticed that a lot of the uh, greenhouses here are divided up into spaces um, for different uses. Yeah, we use our greenhouses for pretty much everything we do. Um, it starts with propagation, so we keep warm, humid spaces for rooting cuttings and starting seeds. And we have a lot of open space that we use for growing our crops too. That space doubles as retail space for our customers to shop through. And we have three standalone greenhouses in our nursery that don't get very much heat. And we, we use those spaces for keeping plants through the winter that can take it a little bit colder and overwintering our perennials. Well, this space we're in obviously is balmy and heated, but I imagine that it's hard to regulate the temperatures in these things and they probably can get pretty hot in the summer, right? Yeah, totally. Ventilation is key. Um, one thing we've been doing is installing passive cooling through roof vents on our greenhouses and that's helped us get away from energy intensive fans to keep the air cool. But it's hard to keep cool in the summer for sure. So what are you using this particular space for? Well, we've got this packed full of fuchsias mostly, but it's production space. So we're keeping it warm and we're keeping it full. We're gonna try to have as much available as possible come springtime. Well, I know that one of the things that most gardeners are interested in greenhouses for is being able to grow things that they can't grow outside or even in the average home. 
Yeah, a lot of people use greenhouses to kind of keep their pet plants, and we do that here too. We have a banana tree up front that actually makes fruit. We have a monstera that is this huge epiphyte growing next to the banana, and we also have the amazing amorpha phallus that blooms almost every spring. That brings people out, I know it. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Smaller greenhouses or cold frames are used by home gardeners for the same reason they are used commercially, just on a smaller scale with less complexity. For seed starting, growing from starts or overwintering potted ornamentals that aren't hardy here, gardeners with potted citrus trees, for instance, often overwinter them in a greenhouse. Sam, what would you say are the biggest differences between a commercial greenhouse and one used by a backyard gardener? A commercial greenhouse is really only different by intention. If you need the space to pay for itself, there's a lot more pressure involved with how you're gonna manage it. But a small, simple cold frame or an unheated greenhouse is so easy to build and so functional for extending your growing season that really everybody should consider keeping one. So let's keep in mind most crops only want to be in a greenhouse during the cold season. So people with backyard greenhouses often struggle when the sun gets too hot in the summer. Uh, the average gardener just needs seasonal greenhouse space. There are infinite ways and motivations for building a greenhouse or cold frame, but for the most part, gardeners want a greenhouse because it's a nice place to be, and when it comes down to it, really, that's why we're here, too. Excellent information, Sam. Thank you so much. Now our viewers know if they have questions about growing in greenhouses, your nursery is a great place to get their questions answered. Yeah, I hope we can help, yes. Excellent, thank you. Thanks for joining us for Planted, and to you, Sam, for sharing your expertise. You've made us feel very welcome. It's wonderful to have such a community-oriented local nursery to fuel our passion for horticulture and for bringing art and magic to gardening. Local viewers can visit the Brothers Greenhouses for awesome plants, expert information, and the Hobbit House seven days a week. Check out our website, www.brothersgreenhouses.com and Facebook page for events and workshops. Until our next episode of Planted, remember, the more you grow, the more you'll know. Links for this episode are posted in the video description.